Boa tarde, pessoal. Sejam todos bem-vindos, então, a mais um seminário em iluminação que, que estamos organizando aqui entre uh, o nosso grupo de pesquisa, né, o grupo GETRE, Inteligência e Iluminação, da Universidade Federal de Santa Maria, uh, junto com o grupo NIMO, uh, Núcleo de Iluminação Moderna, da Universidade Federal de Juiz de Fora. Uh, hoje nós teremos uma, uma apresentação, um webinar uh, em inglês, Uh, mas aqui eu, a abertura eu vou, vou falar um pouco em português, então, para dar alguns avisos. Uh, principalmente, né, uh, dizer que, que esse seminário está sendo também organizado pelo nosso INCT e pelo ramo estudantil e 3 e da Universidade Federal de Santa Maria, uh, que está fornecendo o certificado de participação aos alunos interessados então, vocês têm ali, na, nas primeiras mensagens do chat, da, da transmissão, uh, tem o link para solicitar o, o certificado de participação. Tá? Então, a partir de agora, uh, eu, vou, eu vou passar a apresentar o nosso palestrante em inglês, uh, porque também uh, ele vai apresentar em inglês a, a, o seu trabalho, né? e a gente... Tem, pode ter alguns outros uh, alunos e professores aí que, que não vão entender o português. Uh, so, hi everyone, thank you for uh, being here with us in this webinar. Uh, today we will receive Professor uh, Manuel Arias from the University of Oviedo uh, in Spain. Uh, Professor Manuel Arias um, received his uh, master degree in electrical engineering from the University of Oviedo in 2005 and a PhD from the same university in 2010. Uh, in, in 2007, he started as assistant professor in the same University of Oviedo. And since 2016, he is associate professor at the same university. Uh, his research interests include AC to DC and DC to DC power converters, battery cell equalizers and uh, LED lighting. Uh, the presentation that uh, Professor uh, Manuel Arias will um, give to us today is about uh, high efficiency multiple stage LED drivers. So I'd like to welcome Professor Manuel Arias uh, saying thank you very much for, for being here with us and for preparing this, this work so interesting for, for everyone. Thank you, Professor uh, Manuel. Thank you, Marco, for inviting me. Okay, so well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, as I said, thank you, Marco, for for the invitation. It's always nice to to present the work that you have been working on. In this case, some years ago, in, in, uh, for an audience which is different from the uh, from the industrial staff that hired you to develop the work, or the typical, uh, let's say, conference audience. This uh, this presentation, uh, it's uh, high efficiency multi multiple stage LED drivers. But uh, well, Marco told me that uh, the audience is mainly mainly a student, so. I wanted to to focus on 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 the idea that uh, when you design something, you, you have to bear in mind all all the all the options and all the constraints that you have in in, in your in this case in the project. Okay, for for AEG. So well, I would say that in the case of LED drivers, the key okay for a good design is is knowing the load. The outline of the presentation is uh, well uh, first a, a brief introduction okay to to give the insight of, of the ideas that we follow in, in, in the project that well, I'm going to use as, as the conductor wire for explaining my ideas and the things that I want to, to explain and to, let's say, uh, give some light on them. And then I'm going to explain those ideas with two examples, okay, which are the three-stage solution, a, a driver, an LED driver, AC, LED driver, ACDC with, with three stages, okay, in, in in, in cascaded. 
So I will explain the general structures and the reasons slightly for the three states implementation. And then I will go stage by stage, okay, with some uh, issues regarding especially the third stage and, and the second one, which are not uh, typical in, in, in a design, in an industrial design. And to validate everything and to see that I'm not lying, okay, some experimental results. And then I will explain also multiple uh, states uh, driver, in this case only two states, because the constraints and the conditions and the purpose was slightly different inside LED driving, that is an LED driver, sorry, but slightly different, okay? So the path is going to be the same, the, the different steps, you know, the structure, the first stage, which is the same as in the three stage solution, and then the, the second stage, which is the, the asymmetrical hull bridge. In this case, um, the funny thing, okay, is how we uh, specifically designed the asymmetrical hull bridge for LED driver, for an LED driver, and we uh, focus on three themes, which was the transform optimization, the low frequency ripple elimination, and the self-driven synchronous rectification. But uh, well, the self-driven just if 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 we have time, okay. I, I don't want to extend the presentation too much. So well. Uh, if you review papers or even uh, products in, in industry, and I'm always talking in generally, okay, obviously there are exceptions, but one stage solutions uh, normally are used for uh, low cost, low power, low size applications, the typical light bulb, okay? The main problem when we have an ACDC driver in just one stage is that in the input, we have to perform uh, power factor correction which it can be done with just one stage. But uh, then in the output, okay, if you don't want to have a low frequency ripple, you have to implement that driver, as you can see, with, with an electrolytic capacitor. That is fine for, I would say, nearly all applications. But in the case of, of LED drivers, if you use an electrolytic capacitor, you are reducing the lifespan of, of the light bulb, okay? LEDs are going to last for 10 years, but the driver is not going to last for, let's say, not, not even five years. So in general, okay, the, the whole light bulb is going to have a short lifespan. That's why we keep uh, for one state solutions for low power, low cost, or low size applications. Obviously, we can implement the driver without the ECAP, without the electrolytic cap. But then what we are going to have is a low frequency ripple in the output voltage that leads to, to flickering. And as you all know, well, that, that's not uh, advisable. At least you are not complying with the IEEE uh, flickering recommendations. If you review in uh, product in industry and, and, and uh, papers, okay, scientific papers, the two or three stage solutions are normally used for high power applications in which the high cost and the high or larger volume is acceptable as long as you comply with no ECAPs, because then you will have a long lifespan. That generally is what you, you need, generally speaking, once again, in, in, in high uh, power applications. Normally, uh, you will find that it's said that uh, efficiency is a positive point for one stage solutions, because it's just one stage. And it's not as positive as in two or three stage solutions. But in the project that we developed, we have uh, go, we have not admitted that as, as something completely true. And we make some uh, research. And in the end, we reach a two and a three stage solution, a two, stage, a two or three stage driver with, with an efficiency as high as in this case, I mean, the one stage. And the result is simple, okay? The, the way that you will find normally, once again, uh, the explanation for this in, in, in papers is, three sentences, okay, three assessments, uh, which are actually true, okay? Every time energy is processed, part is lost, and that's completely true. One state drivers process energy once. Well, actually, that's also that's also true, obviously. And then uh, two or three state drivers or converters process energy more than once. Those three uh, sentences are true. And, uh, well, at least in uh, here in Spain, uh, we have, when we are students, we're, uh, in, I mean, in, in a school, okay, we have uh, philosophy, and one part of the philosophy is uh, logic, application of logic. And if you use that wrongly, okay, you would say, okay, the higher the number of stages, the lower the efficiency, 
or one stage drivers have more efficiency than two stage ones or even three stage ones and that is true that is true but if we add uh, the small print like in the contract okay the higher the number of stages the lower the efficiency yes but if you compare with just one of those efficiencies or sorry with one of those stages in fact with the stage with the lowest efficiency or one stage drivers have more efficiency than two stage ones yes that is also true as long as the efficiency of that one stage driver is uh, as high as the efficiency of the stage with the lowest one in the extended topology the example is, is easier okay i'm going to compare a one stage and a three stage led driver let's say that each stage is 97 percent in efficiency so the one stage the overall efficiency is 97 and in the three stages, uh, you have 91, roughly 91%. So well, it seems to be true, the, the first and the second sentence. Even if we increase the efficiency of two of the three stages to 100%, and this addresses the second sentence in blue, the one stage has 97%, and the three stage has 97%. So it's the same. That means that. Uh, Initially, it seems that efficiency is a, is a point, is a positive point for one stage driver. It's, a, it's an advantage that can be applied to one stage drivers and not to three stages. I mean, just for having the same efficiency, you need to, to set the efficiency of two of, the, of two of the three stages to 100%. But then, related to this small print, the question is if 97% is a realistic efficiency for a one stage HCVC LED driver. And uh, is 97% uh, a realistic efficiency for one of the stages of a three-stage ACDC uh, LED driver? For answering that, let's review which are the tasks that you can ask for an LED driver. Power factor correction, galvanic isolation, not always, but in our case, in the project that we developed for AEG, was a requirement. Low frequency ripple cancellation or attenuation that is avoiding flickering. You also want to have a tight current regulation that is setting the current of the LEDs, of the LED string uh, precisely to a value. Uh, let's say 0.35 amps. Full dimming, they are different. You can adjust the current tightly, but maybe you cannot change that value. For instance, with a boost converter, uh, you may have a very precise uh, voltage and current regulation, but you cannot reduce the voltage as much as you want, okay? The minimum is the input voltage of, of the converter. Color quality control, uh, well, I guess you know, but obviously, but uh, with digital dimming, it's more complex, but the quality of the color of the light is, is constant, is, is better than with, with analog dimming, which is, well, it's easier to implement analog dimming, but the color of the of the light is going to change according with, with the dimming that you are applying. And if you have a lamp with several strings in parallel, uh, and if you have a very good regulations, you need to control independently the current in each stream because due to tolerances, aging, and so on, maybe the same voltage does not lead to, to the same current in all of the streams. My point is, imagine that, uh, I guess that there are students, uh, Marco's students here. So imagine that Marco for uh, next week asks for a presentation, uh, preparing some simulations, and also you have to finish a report. Three tasks for the next week in seven days. If you are working alone, obviously you are going to finish all the tasks, but they are not going to be they are not going to be developed in the best way. I mean, because you are not uh, specialized, you are not specializing your task, your time, your, uh, let's say, your your focus in, 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 in the three tasks. You have to divide all these three resources that you have, time, focus, and effort in three tasks. But, but what happens if all the tasks are for the next week, but Marco allows you to organize in groups of three? then one will uh, develop the simulations the other one uh, the presentation and the other one the, the report or maybe you split each task in three but in, in any case you are splitting the uh, amount of work that you have to to develop so my point 
the point of the explanation of this related to LEDs is that in a one stage HEDC LED driver, maybe not all of them, but you have to, to implement power factor correction, maybe galvanic isolation not, but low frequency ripple cancellation, tight current regulation, dimming in just one stage driver. You cannot optimize, generally speaking, please remember this, the, uh, the one stage LED driver. So efficiency, 97% is not realistic for a one stage uh, ACDC LED driver. But in the case of a three stage ACDC LED driver, each stage can be optimized for just one or even two tasks. Okay, so 97 is a reasonable efficiency for each of one of those stages. So with the real numbers, one stage, and there are exceptions, okay, but if you review literature, you will see uh, that the efficiency of one stage ACDC LED drivers is in the in 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 the low tire of 90s okay lower than 92 90 in that range but if you review literature for two or three stage topologies you will see that the efficiency if they are well designed that's the point i want to reach maybe as high as 98 or 97 and that range so the overall efficiency is more or less the same so i'm not saying that efficiency is better in a three stage or in a one stage. It all depends on your design, in your application, but it's not, uh, let's say, a, a point for deciding one stage or three stages. It, it could be better explaining, we see that is a requirement, but selecting one stage or three stages should be ruled by cost, size, lifespan, and even uh, power that you are handling, but not efficiency, okay? Not efficiency. I would like to, to, to explain this and, and to make this, this point clear with, with two cases, okay? The three-stage solution and the two-stage solution. But uh, those three and two-stage solutions were developed in, in my research group, the research group I belong to, for the company AEG. And just for you to know, okay, the, the constraints in 2010 and 11 were uh, the following ones, okay? It was a, a, an AC DC LED driver for uh, for a street lining applications for for a lamppost, okay? With four LED strings of 50 watts each, we have to perform power factor correction. No electrolytic capacitor in those years. It was like the the the, uh, the golden rule in designing drivers. Galvanic isolation. It was a requirement. Is well, depending on the voltage, it makes sense or not, but it was a constraint and a requirement. The efficiency in the range of the initial requirement was 93, but well, let's say that 92, 91, 93 was valid. While the universal range, 30% um, uh, of tolerance, that was a lot, okay, as high as 230 volts RMS multiplied by 1.3 and as low as uh, 0 0.7. Uh, times uh, 110 volts RMS. Constant frequency, that was advisable, but not mandatory dimming, and requirements about size you know, and, and cost, of course, always cost. So for the three estates, <coughs> sorry, following the thing that I said, I, I uh, well, I, I said I, but my research group, okay, we try to follow that rule and we try to specialize each stage. So obviously the first stage is in charge of performing power factor correction. The second stage was in charge only of providing galvanic isolation and voltage adaptation. And the third stages, I said the stages in plural because for each LED string, they wanted an independent regulation. So we place a post regulator here, which was the, the third stage one for each LED stream, in charge of output voltage regulation and ripple cancellation. And I guess that you are saying, well, it's very nice, but you are lying because the blue one has uh, two tasks, not just one. And the yellow one, the third stage, has two tasks, not only one. But uh, we have to take into account that the problem of voltage adaptation is uh, here is a boost converter. So the output voltage given the input, the universal input uh, range and, and the tolerance was as high as four, uh, 400 volts. So here we only needed one in the range of 100. So 
it was advisable to reduce the voltage here from 400 to in the range of, of 100. But that adaptation is quite simple if you have a, a transformer there, if you have a manic isolation. So they are two tasks, but they are interrelated. They are close to very close together. So it can be considered as just one task. It's just selecting the, com, the, the suitable uh, turn rate in the transformer. And output voltage regulation and ripple cancellation, also they are interrelated, okay? If, if you can control the, the current that you are providing to, to the LEDs, in, in generally speaking, with uh, with uh, with nearly any converter, you can cancel a low frequency ripple cancellation. So they are also interrelated. So I'm not lying; it's just one task for each uh, for each stage. Uh, also, I guess that if there are people from from other research groups or from industry, this is obvious. Okay, but for the students, you will face this is a golden rule. Okay, in when you are designing something engineering nothing is free okay so in, in in power electronics when you select a topology you should select a topology whose advantages are relevant for the application and whose disadvantages are irrelevant or at least acceptable for the application and this is the rules that we are going to follow in the design of this driver because it doesn't matter if you select a driver with an efficiency as high as 99 percent for an application if you were requested cost and size uh, probably the, the the best option that addresses those two requirements is going to have a, a lower efficiency than 99 percent but they would be it would be the, the best option the one with with the lowest size and lower efficiency why the boost converter well actually it's a very simple topology only it's a, a topology that can reach a very high efficiency if it's working in, in certain conditions, 97, 98 percent, performing power factor correction. In critical mode, that efficiency is straightforward. And in continuous mode, for having a, a fixed switching frequency, uh, it's not so obvious, but you can reach it with silicon carbide Schottky diodes. And cost was a requirement, but was not the main requirement. Disadvantages, no galvanic isolation. Yes, but I have another uh, stage for complying with that requirement. Output voltage ripple is going to be implemented without electrolytic capacitor, so I'm going to have a considerable voltage ripple in the output. But I have a third stage that is going to cancel it. Even the filter of, of that third stage is going to cancel it partially. But mainly the control, OK, the, 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 the feedback loop. And it has a very high minimum output voltage. It was as high as 400, 450 volts. Yes, but I have a second stage that is going to perform some initial voltage adaptation thanks to the, to the transformer. So those three disadvantages, maybe they are not irrelevant, but they are acceptable because they are going to be canceled. So if just one task, OK, and it's highly optimized. That's, well, I. Uh, Let's keep that. I, I go for the third stage. I'm going to keep the second stage uh, for the last part. And the third stage that we selected was a two input back. OK, what's that? Uh, it's quite simple. It's a back. Here you have the, uh, the MOSFET. Here you have the diode and the output filter of a regular back. And here you have the regular input voltage of a regular back, OK, what is called the high. The difference comes in the diode. It's not connected to ground, but it's connected to a voltage called the low here, which is lower than B high. Let's see the advantage, OK, of how it works. Uh, when the MOSFET is switching, in a back converter, you have this uh, voltage applied to the input of the filter. But with the two input back, you will have the blue line. OK, you have this voltage applied here. And this is the uh, static gain OK, of uh, input back. It's D times the high voltage, like in a pack, OK, but it's then V low times 1 minus D. But with this waveform in the input of the filter, that voltage is going to be easier to filter. So the, the inductor is going to be smaller. And I'm going to reduce losses, which is something very important when we have three stages uh, handling the power. But also, the semiconductors are smaller than in a pack. In a pack, the MOSFET and the diode, they have to be designed to withstand B high. In this case, it's B high minus B low. OK, it's easy to see. So as this MOSFET and this diode, they are smaller, they are designed for a lower voltage, 
losses are going to be also uh, reduced. They are going to be lower. And there's another reason. Maybe you will find uh, direct uh, energy, which is directly derived from input, from input to output, and uh, to input back, uh, follow that rule. I'm not going to develop that, but uh, you can say that part of the energy is directly transferred from the input to the output without being processed. Okay, You, you can make some electrical transformations in, in the schematic, and it's easy to see that. So it's going to be considerably higher than in a back converter. It has two disadvantages. The first one is that the MOSFET is floating. But what we can rearrange everything in this way. We are not changing nothing, OK? The voltage with stored by MOSFET and diode is the same, V high minus V low here. Uh, the MOSFET now, the advantage is referred to ground. And it's true that the LED string is not referred to ground. But in this particular case, the LED string is not going to be touched by a, a regular by regular people. I mean, it's going to be in a lamppost 10 meters far from the street. So no one is going to touch that if it's not allowed to touch that. Technicians, yes, but they know what they do. So now we have one of the disadvantages, which actually is the same as in a bag, uh, is omitted. Okay, we have erased that uh, disadvantage. So uh, the other one, we will see them, but let's analyze, OK, uh, why the, the two input back. Once again, OK, nothing is free. So let's see if the advantages and disadvantages match the, uh, the application. Simple topology, the efficiency is 97, 98, or even 99%. It has enough bandwidth to define the, the, the LED current and to cancel the low frequency ripple that is going to be transferred from the output of the first stage to the input of, of the third stage. So the boost disadvantage, that boost disadvantage dealing with the, with the ripple is cancelled. Uh, we don't have galvanic isolation in, in the uh, two input back, but we have the second stage. We need two input voltages. That is true. But if uh, we remember, we have a transformer in the second stage. If you have a transformer obtaining two one or three output voltages is quite simple. The only thing that you have to add is an additional winding. So needing two, two input voltages is not forcing to implement uh, an additional transformer, sorry, an additional converter for supplying that additional output voltage. It's just an additional winding in a transformer. It's a little bit more waves and cost, but it's acceptable. It's not a whole converter. And the main disadvantage is that, uh, in generally speaking, okay, not for LED drivers, but generally speaking, the two input back has a minimum voltage, which cannot be lower than the low, than the, than the voltage uh, that connected to the diode. Normally, that it may be a, a, an important drawback, okay, because you want normally your, your drivers to, sorry, your converters to reach zero voltage in the output. But in the case of the LEDs, as you know, what it's not a problem. Well, no, but you know this, okay? This is the, the relation between the voltage and the current, and here between the current and the and the light. So if you think about it, if you want the maximum amount of light, you need a current and you need a voltage. If you want zero light, you don't have to apply zero voltage. You have to apply to the LED string a voltage equal to the new voltage of the LEDs, more or less, times the number of of LEDs that you have in the string. So some fast calculations, assuming the duty cycle equal to one, the maximum one, and the minimum one equal to zero, the topology is perfectly valid, and you will be able to completely turn on and turn off the LEDs, the LED string, as long as uh, V high, OK, the, the input voltage of the two input back, the high one, is equal to the maximum uh, voltage that you need in the LED string to provide the maximum amount of light and the low voltage the low uh, voltage in the low input voltage of the two input back as low as the uh, knee voltage times the number of leds in the string with that you have full dimming and you can use the two input back with the efficiency that it has okay once again the disadvantage of the two input back in this particular application it is it's Oh, it's perfectly acceptable, can be disregarded, in fact. So this negative point is cancelled, and the other two are solved at the other stages. 
and as you can see, this is the second stage, okay, for obtaining uh, the two input voltages of the of the two input back. The only thing I'm doing is adding an additional winding here, okay, an additional output to this topology. We call this topology the electronic transformer. Okay, it was proposed. You have in the presentation at the end. You have all the uh, all the references. Okay, but all the paper, relevant papers. But it's called. We call them electronic transformer. It was presented by Fred Lee in 2000 and, and around 2005, I think, uh, for and and it's a very funny topology. Okay, it it provides galvanic isolation is the main objective of this topology and voltage adaptation. By means of of the uh, of the turns ratio of each uh, transformer, in this case two, okay, have two turns ratio here, two different output voltages, at very high efficiency. The problem is that it works; it's a resonant topology that works with a fixed duty cycle. So the output voltages are unregulated. Okay, if we change the input voltage, the output voltages are going to change accordingly. But let's see the uh, the advantages first. Okay. Estoy en una... Javi, ¿qué estoy? Sorry. Estoy en conferencia. Bueno, eh, sorry about that. Uh, the, uh, the high efficiency is uh, achieved with uh, thanks to zero current switching okay, in the diodes. Uh, it's achieved thanks to the resonance between the leakage inductance in the transformer, okay, in the secondary of the transformer, and the output cap. So also, uh, that topology has uh, a very reduced bill of material because we are using the leakage inductance of, of the transformer and for the resonance, we are using the output capacitor. So the number of components is reduced in comparison to other options, okay? And also, we can reach zero voltage switching in the MOSFET thanks to the uh, energy that we are storing in the leakage inductance of the primary side. Moreover, okay, moreover, uh, if it's a resonant topology, we will see it later. Um, if you achieve zero voltage switching, you achieve zero voltage switching no matter the load that you have here. It's independent of the load. You can achieve zero voltage switching even at no load conditions, which is actually very interesting for this application. The problem is that uh, the condition for the zero current switching in this case, okay, for reducing the switching losses, is that we don't have we don't have regulation. That means that uh, these two output voltages, V out high and V out low, are going to be equal to the input voltage multiplied by again, actually the turn ratio of the transformer. So any ripple, and we are going to have here low frequency ripple that comes from the first stage, is going to be transferred to this output voltage. But it's not a problem, once again, because it's going to be cancelled by the control loop of the third stages. As I said, each one has a task. Briefly, because I think it's a, a very interesting uh, way of analyzing the topology, and, and I said it was a very nice topology. It's a full bridge, okay, just we are going to analyze just one winding, okay, one transformer. Um, we have a full bridge in which uh, it's operated with a 50% duty cycle. This is the dead time between closing M1 and M4 and N2 and M3. Here it's enlarged, okay. Obviously, dead times is normally they are shorter, that, shorter sorry, than this. Uh, when we close N2 and M3, this one and this one, we are applying the input voltage to the transformer. It's going to be reflected to the secondary side, and we are going to have a resonance between this leakage inductance and this cap. Here you have the, sorry, the current through this leakage inductance. Here you have the resonant voltage, which is also the output voltage, so we are going to have a considerable um, high frequency, in this case, high frequency ripple. And when we apply, uh, when we close M1 and M4, the other way around through this winding, okay, the red line. Two resonances, these two circuits that we can merge and everything can be analyzed with this simple circuit here, the output current, the resonant cap, the diode to avoid negative part in, in the resonant current, and the leakage inductance, which normally can be perfectly designed to be both equal or virtual equally, okay, quite close. And the input voltage with its, sorry, the input voltage to this circuit, which is the input voltage referred to the secondary side, multiplied by N, and including, okay, the small dead time that we have here. 
The ripple, as I said, is not negligible, but once again, it's a high frequency ripple. It's not generating flickering. It's not, uh, uh, it can be, maybe it's not canceled by the control loop of the third stage, but it's filtered by the output filter of those two input bugs. So that's not a, a negative point. And also, the idea, as you see, the analysis is quite simple, and the equations actually are simple, okay? I'm not going to explain them, but here comes the important thing, okay? This, this factor here is multiplying the sinusoidal, this sinusoidal expression, and here is divided. So when you design this, this topology, in the end, it's a trade-off between the voltage ripple and the current ripple, that is the peak of the resonant current that you want. Uh, if you increase one, in the, if you want to reduce one, for instance, increasing this factor here, if you reduce the ripple in the output voltage, then you will have a higher current. So you have to take that into account. Also, uh, the leakage inductance, you can define and design that uh, value to a certain limit, okay? It all depends on the way you design the transformer. So you have to take into account that there are some limits in the leakage inductance that you can reach and uh, the minimum leakage inductance that you can reach. And also, uh, you cannot implement any, any value of capacitor. Obviously, there is a limit because you don't want to use e caps. Let's see if, if uh, the idea, not the topology, okay? the idea of designing with several stages but very optimized, it's true that you can reach very high efficiency. This is a proof of concept, okay? This is not the final, the final product, obviously. Uh, the second stage for 200 watts, the output is 140 and 80, more or less. And this is the, the size of this magnetic core. Here you have the four stages, the four third stages, okay, one for each string. This is the size of, of, of the uh, magnetic cores, it's at Mi20. And more or less, we reach total current in it. Zero current sitting in the diodes of the electronic transformer. This is the, through one of the diodes. And as you, if you see, it's resonant, as I said. Zero voltage switching in the MOSFETs. That is, uh, I turn on the MOSFET. If you see, the gate voltage goes up, but uh, goes up when the drain source voltage is already zero. So I don't have switching losses in the turning on of the MOSFETs. Regarding the third stage, uh, this is uh, the voltage of the diode. And if you see, it's not 140, but it's 140 minus 80. So the size of the diode and the size of the MOSFET is not uh, according to a voltage or withstanding a voltage of 140, but only 60. And then this is the voltage uh, zero in this snapshot of, of, of the oscilloscope. And this is the voltage of the, the input voltage to the filter. If you see, it changes between 140 and 80. This waveform is easier to filter than in, a, in a, than in a back converter, okay? So the filter is going to be smaller and losses are going to be reduced. Uh, if we connect second and third stages and we apply the constant, okay, without ripple voltage, we can see that the high frequency uh, ripple, well, it's acceptable. It was during the, well, when we presented everything to, to the industry. But obviously, if you want to reduce this, you increase a little bit, a little bit the output filter, and it's going to work. And if you apply the voltage as high as uh, nearly 20%, okay, 70 volts peak to peak with an input voltage of 400, uh, you see that here we have a considerable uh, ripple, but in the output current, it's not so big. And once again, if you tune the feedback loop even more, you can reduce this low frequency ripple even more. Okay? Yeah, it was just the proof of concept in this case. Let's see efficiency for the two input back. If you see, sometimes it's even higher than 99%. Because, well, I mean, for the reasons that I gave you, the electronic transformer in the range of 97%. If we merge to the, the third stages and the second stage, we are in the range of 94, 95, even nearly 96, and as low as at low voltage, very low, uh, um, sorry, very low current in the output, uh, uh, 92 which is reasonable. If you consider everything, boost, electronic transformer, and the four two input packs, the efficiency in nominal conditions is as high as 92%, higher than that. So similar to a one uh, to one stage LED driver. 
that's the point that I wanted to, to address. So a three-stage topology is valid, okay? For, for an LED driver, even if you want high efficiency, the only th the thing that you have to do is optimizing each task Oh, sorry, each uh, uh, converter, each uh, stage for just one task, assuming that maybe you have to spend some uh, money in more expensive components, a silicon carbide. And um, if you take into account in the third stages and in the second one, uh, the, uh, the consideration, the rules, the, uh, the conditions imposed by the load, you can optimize uh, the topology for reaching very, very high efficiency. So once again, efficiency is not something for one stage solutions. It's generally speaking for all of them, okay, one stage, two stage, three stage solutions, if they are conveniently designed. And I don't know if you're going to have this available, but here you have uh, the references, okay? For the uh, two stage topology, following the same, uh, following the same idea, uh, what we did, okay, uh, but once again, my, my idea here is not explaining our solution, but proving that uh, for the for the students, okay, if you optimize the, the design of, of the things that you are requested to do once in, you are working for, for in the industry or for a company, if you optimize everything, if you consider every tiny detail in the loads, in the input voltage, in the conditions, in the constraints, you may keep very high efficiency and avoiding the negative part of, of the of the each converter that you select. And here is another way of seeing that. Okay. The first stage, power factor correction, boost converter, nothing new. Second stage, galvanic isolation, the tasks are galvanic isolation, voltage adaptation. I have a, a transformer, so they are linked uh, requirements, output voltage regulation and ripple cancellation. Once again, now I'm lying, okay, the, the, the blue stage, the second stage has, well, not four, but two state, two tasks, okay, galvanic isolation and voltage regulation. Yes, but uh, in this case, uh, AEG said, said, sorry, that they wanted to explore uh, supplying uh, LED strings, but without independent control. That That is, they assume that they were going to place here some tiny resistors to a passive equalization of the current. If you do that, it makes no sense to uh, implement an independent controller for each LED string. So we decided to target this. Also, they wanted to explore the option of having a low voltage uh, LED lamp that is here in the range of 24, something like that. Uh, that means that uh, we were going to have a lot of strings. So placing one uh, post regulator in each string was uh, uh, that it was actually very, very expensive and the volume and the size was going to be very, very big. So only uh, two stages was advisable in this case. And we use the asymmetrical half reads. Once again, the topology, generally speaking, is not valid for a, a real application in nearly any case, but for LEDs, is a very good uh, topology, in fact. Uh, the difference with a standard half bridge is that um, the MOSFET M1 and the MOSFET uh, 2 they are not having, they are not sharing the same duty cycle. When MOSFET S1 is closed during D, okay, means that MOSFET uh, 2 is going to be closed during 1 minus D. They are complementary, okay. That is what that's why it's called a symmetrical or complementary control half bridge. Uh, that means that the voltages in the input capacitor are not going to be equal to Vg divided by 2. Another difference with the half bridge. They follow this rule. They depend, they depend on the duty cycle. And these voltages are going to be applied to the transformer, reflected to the secondary side. And in the filter, you are going to have a voltage. In the, input, the input voltage of the filter is going to be like this. This one, if you remember, it's quite similar to the input voltage of the two input back. So uh, the filter in under certain conditions, in this case, not always, but under certain conditions, is also to be, as in the two input back, is going to be a smaller. And the voltage when filter leads to this static gain, okay, that's fine. Once again, okay, let's see if, if uh, advantages and disadvantages uh, fit the load. The filter is going to be a smaller, not always, but uh, under certain conditions. We have zero voltage switching in primary switches, 
thanks to the complementary control, we have zero voltage switching, not like in the standard uh, half reach. And also, thanks to the way the, uh, the MOSFETs are driven, okay, we always have voltage in, in the secondary side, negative like this one or positive. Why is this interesting? Okay, this is interesting because the application was for low voltage uh, LED strings. And in that particular case, we can use this voltage here for directly driving these MOSFETs, which are performing the synchronous rectification. Uh, just to mention, synchronous rectification is replacing uh, diodes by, by MOSFETs to reduce uh, losses. So thanks to the way this is, dry, uh, this is driven, these two MOSFETs, we have a control signal in the output of the transformer. We don't have to use a specific controller for these two MOSFETs. And this uh, reduces cost, size, and increases efficiency also. So we have a simple topology with an efficiency in the range of 94, optimized for cell-driven synchronous rectification, which is advisable in this uh, application, galvanic isolation, and well, the transformer can be optimized for this application. The dynamic behavior is very poor, that is true. But we will see that in this particular case, once again, thanks to the conditions imposed by the load, it's not a problem. Uh, briefly, okay, very fast, but uh, if we consider, uh, we, anal we analyze this topology, uh, surprisingly, the average magnetizing current is not zero. Okay, uh, the current, uh, uh, the liquid current in the primary side is zero, the average value, because it comes from two cups. So, uh, the current through the real transformer and the current through the magnetizing inductance are equal in value with one of them with negative sign. What can we do? Traditionally, and it's also thinking a little bit out of the box, uh, you design N1 equal to N2, but that's for, because it's simple, okay? It's, uh, the, the design of the transformer is, is easier. But in this particular case, you will have what is called the traditional design. The average value of the magnetizing current is going to be like this. It's very high. So the, the resulting transformer is going to have higher losses, is going to be bigger to avoid uh, saturation in the worst case. But if you play it, if you sorry, if you pay attention to the static gain, the value, the stat of the static gain, the gain depends on N1 plus N2. If you keep constant this value, you can change N1 and N2 like this one and you are not affecting the static gain. What we are going to do, it's explained with equations in the next slide, but what we are going to do is changing N1 and N2 inside this range, so considering that we have this range for, for the duty cycle following this equation, I will explain it. And we will try to change N1 and N2, keeping the value of both, adding both together constant, but to reduce the average value, to keep it as low as possible, around zero. The idea is quite simple. For minimize the average value, what we do is we make this value and this value equal in average in, in absolute value. Okay, we impose that condition and we have this equation here. This condition leads to this equation. Also, we have a duty cycle. Uh, actually, the average value of d min plus d max, which leads to uh, a magnet average magnetizing current equal to zero. And then we, for, we use these two equations. N1 plus N2 is defined with this equation. And when you have N1 plus N2, you use this equation to define, and well, and this zero to define N2. You are not affecting the static gain, but you are optimizing the transformer. And this does not affect zero voltage switching. Okay, you reduce the size of the transformer, you reduce the average value of the of the magnetizing current, but, but switching losses, sorry, uh zero voltage switching and reduction of the switching losses is not affected. Uh, that depends on the value of in the instant value of the leakage current in the primary side. And that one is not affected. If the uh, current through the transformer, ideal transformer goes down, this keeps constant. And the one which increases is uh, the magnetizing current. So nothing to do with zero voltage reading. There are more things, but uh, I keep them aside at least by the moment. The interesting thing is, we have a very poor dynamic behavior. Actually, so poor that you cannot design normally a, a control loop for canceling a ripple of 100 uh, hertz. Not even that. Uh, the reason is that we have a resonance between these two caps 
and the magnetizing inductance. Normally, they have high, uh, high value, OK? And the resonance of this double pole DS, double zero is going to be located at very low frequencies. We will see it. Here you have the equations. And also, it's a pity, but they don't have the same value. So they don't, can, they don't cancel each other. What we have here, you have uh, the transfer function between the output voltage and the duty cycle. The duty cycle here is, uh, sorry, the resonance is located in, in the range of one kilohertz. So any, and it's quite high, the resonance. So any control loop, any feedback loop that you design is, is going to be in the range of 10, no bandwidth, no, no more than that. Or maybe uh, here or in this range between 10 and 100, but it's not going to be able to cancel a low frequency ripple of 100, 100, and, and 20 hertz. So we have a look at the, uh, at the uh, conditions of the load. Keeping VLC apart, uh, Diego from my university is going to give a, a very nice presentation, actually far better than this one, about VLC. OK, but from our application, we don't have VLC. And we can consider LEDs very slow. Why? The control loop only has to face changing uh, changes. Sorry, in the characteristics of the LEDs uh, due to thermal, due to aging, but they are very slow uh, issues. Even the user is slow. I mean, if you turn on or turn off the light or or you apply dimming, you are going to be very slow in comparison to any uh, regular uh, feedback loop. So uh, the feedback loop. Uh, following those conditions can be really, really slow. If we want the feedback loop to be fast, if we, we want to cancel the low-frequency ripple. But then we don't care about the feedback loop, What about the uh, transfer function between the output voltage and the duty cycle. What is relevant is the audio susceptibility, that is the, the, the transfer function between the output voltage and the input one. We have the resonance, but we can design a feed-forward loop. And this feed-forward loop is not affecting uh, the stability. The stability, the problem is here in which you are using V out to define the duty cycle and the duty cycle define the uh, V out, but not here. So we have a filter to, uh, to, to obtain the value of the ripple. We have the gain of the feedback, in the, oh, sorry, of the feed forward loop. And then we are changing the control voltage accordingly to cancel the ripple or to cancel the effect of the ripple in the input voltage in the output voltage of sorry the ripple of the input voltage in the uh, in the output voltage if you see with a conveniently uh, designed feed forward loop the uh, the uh, audio susceptibility goes from let's say well roughly minus 40 dbs to uh in the range of 100 in the range of minus uh, 90 or 80. so it's a considerable reduction in the output voltage trip. Funny thing is that uh, here you have a simulation, and if you see, we have a very relevant reduction, okay, from two amps in the ripple to 0 point, uh, 0 0.35 amps, but the effect is a little bit strange because uh, here the ripple goes down, like here, but here the ripple also goes down. It should be in the range of value of uh, 5.20 or something like that to follow the this anisoidal behavior. The problem is that the static gain, it can be explained with this expression, but it's easier to follow with this. The static gain is not, um, uh, it's, not um, it's not linear, like in a uh, proportional, like in a, in a back converter, okay? Uh, in a back converter, the, the fit for while uh, loop works nicely, okay? It's perfect, the cancellation is perfect. In this particular case, no. It's easy to see, okay? Here you have the static gain, okay, the output voltage as a function of D for three different input voltages, which actually they are going to take place. Imagine that you have the voltage uh, VA, okay, this voltage here. Forget, forget about v, uh, VD, the voltage V. You fix a nominal duty cycle when the input voltage is nominal. Perfect. When the voltage, when the input voltage goes up, okay, you need to reduce the duty cycle to D1. So you need a reduction of delta D1. But when the uh, input voltage goes down, okay, and you want to keep the voltage constant in the value VA, you need to increase the duty cycle to D2. 
but the increment is not equal to delta d1. The increment is delta d2. If you see, it's considerably larger. There is a, a, a nonlinear uh, uh, behavior there in the change of the duty cycle. And the uh, fit forward loop was designed with just a proportional gain, to keep it simple. The solution is uh, quite simple. We have split it, the ripple in the positive part and in the negative part, and we design a different gain for each part, the gain FF1 and the gain FF2, two different transfer functions or controls. Okay. So in the end, we move from with just one feed forward loop from 0 0.35 to 0 0.20. It's not perfect, like in a back converter, but it's better. We reduce nearly, we cut to half the, the ripple at no cost because we don't have to add a very complex additional circuitry, it's just uh, two additional uh, operational amplifiers. Let's see if this works, okay? This is uh, the prototype. Actually, we have to develop one for high voltage and the other one for low voltage, but the rest of the issues is exactly the same, okay? Uh, well, uh, the MOSFET is here, the size of the inductor and the transformer is 20 and 30, just one uh, second stage, so we can spend a little bit more in the space. And some of the parameters, if you see, the turns ratio are uneven, okay? They are not equal. This is a photograph of the proof of concept. Once again, it's not the final prototype. And here you can see that we have zero voltage switching. Okay, the voltage in the MOSFET goes down and reaches zero before we turn on that MOSFET. So we don't have current and voltage at the same time uh, in, the, in the MOSFET during the turning on. And here you have uh, the, the efficiency improvement, okay? With a traditional design in which we have uh, symmetrical uh, windings in the transformer and using silicon carbide devices, we have very low efficiency. With the standard design, which means that uh, we are addressing the things that I already explained regarding uh, changing the value of N1 and N2, they are not equal. We improve a little bit the efficiency. If we use silicon carbide in the output, not um, uh, synchronous rectification, but silicon carbide, okay? In the low voltage, in the high voltage application, we have uh, an efficiency a little bit higher than 90. And with the proposed design, and that means uh, not only designing the transformer with different number of turns in the secondary windings, but also, <coughs> sorry, optimizing, optimizing its design for zero voltage switching. Uh, I mean, it's something very interesting, but I didn't have time. We can improve the efficiency to roughly 93, 92, something like that. For another application, well, for another application, for another voltage, uh, we can increase a little bit the, the efficiency. And here you have the same values of efficiency with the same, uh, the, I mean, with, for the same application with different input voltages and different frequencies. And if you see, when we optimize the design a little bit, we are uh, above uh, 50, sorry, about 94 uh, percent, 94 percent in efficiency for 50 kilohertz of switching frequency. Again, okay? and when we have those voltages, well, it changes a little bit depending on the input voltage, but in average, is uh, 94 percent roughly. Okay? Considering that the boost converter in average has an efficiency of roughly close to 98 percent, the overall efficiency once again is, is in the range of 92. And just to conclude, okay, uh, regarding the feed forward, if we are not implementing the, the feed forward with an stable feedback loop, the vector cancellation that we can reach is this one, okay? We have a ripple of 30% in the output. That's a, a lot of flickering that is not acceptable. With a single feed forward, we reduce to 7%. And with a double feed forward, to 3%. If you compare this with this, you may say that double feed forward is not useful, but you have to take into account that this is achieved at no cost. It's just adding one operational amplifier extra. And also, the higher the maximum duty cycle, the closer to the nonlinear region of the static gain of the asymmetrical half bridge. And the worst is going to be the ripple attenuation. Here we were designing for 0 0.4, but we were not using the range from 0 0.4 to 0 0.5. If you try to use that range, the ripple with this solution is going to be larger. And then the double feed forward loop uh, makes more sense. So 
once again, uh, efficiency may be high, okay, if you take into account the characteristics of the load, even if you use a two-stage topology and non, uh, not a one-stage one. Uh, additionally, using a two-stage topology, you can uh, reduce flickering without using electrolytic capacitor. The only thing that you have to do, okay, is uh, trying to take advantage of all the features of your converter and all the characteristics and features of your load. So, I think here you have all, well, all the references regarding the asymmetrical half reads. As you see, not many, uh, Lately, there are more papers about the asymmetrical, but in, in 2010, not many people were studying uh, that converter. So sorry about that, but all the references comes from people that I know in Madrid or, or people that I work with here in, in University of Oviedo. So thank you very much, muito obrigado. And I don't know how this goes now. I don't know how Marco can uh, address me the questions through the chat, I guess, or something like that. Uh, well, uh, thanks. I'd like to, to thank you, Manu, for your nice presentation. Uh, and now uh, I would uh, ask to, to people that are uh, watching this, this presentation to, uh, to send the, the questions uh, through the, the chat. Uh, now I will speak it in Portuguese. Uh, pessoal, então, muito obrigado pela atenção de todos. Uh, se alguém tiver alguma questão que gostaria de, de fazer para um, o pro professor Manuel e não quiser escrever em inglês, aí pode mandar em português mesmo que, que eu traduzo aqui. Ah. Well, uh, Manu, uh, we, we will start so, with some uh, questions from, the, from Igor. Uh, thanks, he is congratulating in your presentation, and he's asking about uh, if you are currently working with a, a gallium nitride-based LED drivers, so, because this is a, a, a very hot topic nowadays, and mainly regarding uh, the, the increase of efficiency and decrease of volume. Uh, so we, we have these, uh, curiosity if you are working with uh, this kind of LED drivers? Uh, not me, not me. Uh, now that uh, one of uh, Marcos' students is, is working with us, maybe it's something that we are going to address in, in regular LED drivers, but uh, those, all the things that I have presented comes from uh, seven years, well, more than seven years ago, 10 years ago. So in those years, uh, uh, GAN and, and well, GAN is, was not so used, it was not so general and it was not so accessible to, to researchers as it is now. But it's true that uh, it's, as Marco said, a hot topic. In VLC, okay, in VLC it's a different thing. And I guess uh, maybe it's more a question for, for Diego on Friday, but I, I, I'm not pretty sure, but maybe Diego is. Uh, I know I don't know if they have already designed something with with gun, but I think that they are at least they are planning. But uh, once again, I think that it would be a better answer. You will get a better answer if you ask that on on Friday. Friday, yes, on Friday. Okay, just just to complete this uh, this information, Igor uh, is asking about your opinion about the replacement of uh, silicon for for gun. Uh, transistor in LED drivers, mainly in the second stage, the, the power control stage. Generally, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, generally speaking, I think it's a, a, a good point to research. Yes, I think it's a, it's a good option. Uh, but as I said, uh, I'm not an expert, so uh, I cannot say, I cannot uh, tell you which uh, the results are gonna be because I have not uh, researched in, in that, I guess. And my opinion is that as Marco said, it's a hot topic. And uh, if you use GAN, if your application allows you to use GAN nowadays due to well, uh, some constraints uh, regarding cost or, or things like that, if you're allowed to use GAN, it could be uh, it could be an improvement in, in efficiency as, as Marco said, but uh, uh, as I, uh, I'm afraid that we have not been working on that, and actually now LEDs is uh, 
a side topic in 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 my in, not in our research group but in the task i mean the projects that i've been assigned to so i'm sorry but uh, i cannot uh, answer more than that just to say that i think it's a good option okay uh, thanks manu I, I have some some questions some uh, and comments about the 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 works you presented um first i uh, i i will not ask about coast because i i saw a lot of uh, <laughs> active switches uh, this is not the, the the idea but um you have a lot of um uh, active switch switching uh, and this uh, normally generates uh, emi electromagnetic mm. interference so uh, did you get some results of emi of these two structures the the three stage and the, the two stage topologies uh the good, uh officially no but uh, obviously you know uh, when you design the prototype you are going to get uh, while you are trying to make it work to make it work uh, you are going to have uh, some issues regarding emi because a noise is affecting one part of the of the circuit or another and we had two issues there one was in the second stage the 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 first design okay um uh, when we started uh, i mean you 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 power the uh, the the control it was everything was nice but it's true that uh, when you try to fix put everything together uh the second stage, the MOSFETs of the second stage started to switch when they shouldn't be switching and they blew up for, I think that I burned like 10 or, or 15. So it's true that when the, the, when you increase the number of the stages, uh, you have more switching, you have more noise and you have to be, uh, you have to take that, uh, that into account. What we did in the four stages, which are actually very close to each other, is that we synchronized the four controllers. We use a controller that it has, uh, well, it has because it's it's still on production, uh, synchronizing input, okay, a clock input. So all of them were switching at the same time. So we didn't have any issue between the four stages when they were implemented together. And in the second stage, uh, we have to carefully design the PCB. Yes, that, okay. In, in the second design, the first design, it's it's funny, but everything worked nice because, as you see in the photograph, everything was set apart. Okay, we we the second stage was uh, like ten centimeters away from the fourth stages, so from the four third stages. So in that case, no. But when uh, in the company where they design everything together, uh, routing it was uh, well a main concern, and in the first stage. Uh, the boost converter in, in uh, critical mode is operating with variable switching frequency. And then uh, EMI was a little bit more, um, it was a very relevant issue, but that was, was a commercial, uh, well, not a commercial, but it was a prototype from AEG to be implemented in the size they wanted. So it was already well designed, a nice design to, to avoid problems with, uh, with uh, EMI. But it's true that, uh, as you said, in this particular case, the, the higher the number of stages, more interaction between between the between the switching between the switching devices. Okay. Um, another another question, Manu. Um, I I agree that for these uh, power, these output power, you you cannot work with uh, one stage drivers, LED drivers since uh, 200 watts is uh, uh, very much for one stage, mainly because of the size of the electrolytic capacitor. Uh, but the, um, let's say the, the conventional solution, uh, mainly for industry, is to use a boost converter uh, as the PFC converter and a, a, a buck converter as the, the, the power control stage, you know? Uh, and can you comment about uh, the pros and cons of your solutions uh, compared to the conventional solution? For example, using a, a buck converter uh, in, uh, in co uh, continuous conduction mode. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's 
it's perfectly valid, okay? It, it follows the, the things that I wanted to, to explain to, to, uh, to your students, which is uh, as long as you design everything nicely and according to the law, it's going to work fine. The problem is uh, when you connect the, the boost and the pack, okay, the advantage is that you only need one input voltage. You don't have isolation, but if you don't need it, uh, adding something with, with a transformer, it makes no sense, generally speaking. Uh, so I would say that uh, the boost plus the pack is the best option if you don't want galvanic isolation. And obviously, you cannot obtain too easily, okay, two outputs for the two input back. That's the advantage. It's very simple and it's going to work nice. They are very robust and simple topologies with very high efficiencies. Uh, you can reach uh, in the boost converter and in the back converter. When the boost in critical mode, you have zero voltage switching and zero current switching. In the back converter in continuous conduction mode, you have zero voltage switching at least in one of the MOSFETs. So efficiency is going to be uh, acceptable. When I say acceptable, it's similar to the asymmetrical half bridge. But if you are asked to have um, a uh, galvanic isolation, then that solution is not valid. Not because it's bad, just because you don't have a transformer. In that case, you usually use, a, if I remember correctly, it's uh, an LLC resonant converter. But coming back to the back uh, converter, forget, forgetting about the LLC. Uh, the main problem is that for the same conditions of design, the efficiency of the back is going to be lower always compared to the two input back. What's the problem of the two input back that cannot be used with the boost converter alone because you need two outputs. Okay, you need two, uh, two outputs. And if you need a second output voltage, normally you need an additional converter. The additional converter means more cost, more switching devices, more EMI, uh, and, and lower efficiency. So it's not that, uh, I would say that they are not, um, one is better than the other. I would say that if I'm not requested to have uh, galvanic isolation and, uh, and uh, maybe I don't want to have a very, very high efficiency in the second stage, it's better to use a boost converter plus a back converter. But in the moment in which you are requested uh, Galvanic isolation, I think that you should take into account that the additional output voltage with a galvanic isolation with a transformer is straightforward. So why not use a, a two input back? OK, OK, I understand. The, the isolation is uh, a requirement of this project. So a uh, resonant LLC could be the, the, compari the fair comparison with your uh, solution. Mm, yes, and and well, actually, we did that comparison, and and the LLC has an efficiency, uh, let's say, operating in with a fixed duty cycle. Okay, if you've set the, the the operating point, it's not going to change. The efficiency is going to be more or less similar to uh, to the uh, to the electronic transformer that I presented because the concept is more or less similar. The main advantage of the of the electronic transformer is that we have, once again, uh, we have lower number of components and the disadvantages due to having lower number of components were uh, negligible because we have higher output uh, voltage ripple that is filtered by the third stage. And uh, the, the other one was uh, uh, regarding with the LLC. We don't have control, okay? That is true, but we didn't need control, okay? And and the LLC, if it's operated, uh, let's say, changing the frequency because you want to regulate the output voltage, then the efficiency is affected, it's going to be lower. So they are also similar solutions. The only thing that we did is, okay, we have third stages. If we have regulation, uh, regulating capability in the third stage, then we are going to omit that uh, regulation in the second stage to simplify it and to obtain higher efficiency. That's why we selected the electronic transformer and not the LLC. Okay, thank you, Manu. I have a question here from Professor uh, Diego Lamar. I don't know if you know this, this researcher, but he's asking uh, if you <laughs> use it, the, the two input buck, uh, asymmetrical half region, electronic transform topology in other applications. 
Ah, uh, yes. Yes, the electronic transformer. We are using the electronic transformer in space applications. When I said that I was not working now in, in, in LEDs, uh, in LED projects is, well, uh, because the projects with AEG finished, uh, VLC is a topic that DIY is in charge of, and then I started with with uh, space satellite applications again okay, in the in the power in the power subsystems of of satellites. Uh, the asymmetrical uh, half bridge, yes, a variation with the asymmetrical half bridge. Uh, we had an idea about using um, the asymmetrical half bridge in combination what with what we call. Uh, voltage traps in 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 cell equalizers. Okay, in cell equalizers. Uh, it was funny because uh, it seems to be a new concept. But when we presented the idea to to the project leader, to the research group leader Javier Sebastián, uh, he said that actually those traps is a very common uh, concept in 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 telecommunication in antennas. So we merge everything antennas and well that idea of traps and the asymmetrical half bridge and we developed a, a cell equalizer for, for battery applications, okay, a cell equalizer in which you only have two active switches because generally speaking, you have a lot of switches in, in, in battery cell equalizers. And uh, the, what else? Well, no, yes, that, those applications. And the two input back. And the two input back, but uh, well, if you want, I'm going to, uh, Introduce your presentation, your Friday presentation about VLC. Nice presentation is going to be better than this one. And you will see that the two input back can be nicely used in, in VLC. Okay. Actually, I I was in the uh, in the assessment committee of a PhD uh, thesis, uh, one of the student, one of Diego's uh, students, and they presented the use of the two input back. A very, very good uh, thesis, by the way. Okay, uh, Manu, I have a one last question from from my part. Uh, if anyone has another question, can send through through the chat. But this is my my last question. Uh, you you presented your uh, LED driver using four LED branches in parallel. Uh, so I, I'd like to ask you why to use uh, four branches in parallel. Do, do you have any requirement of output voltage? or uh, a, a standard that you have to follow in Europe? Uh, this is no, a, the, a curiosity. Mm, mm, no, it was uh, the number of strings and the voltage of the strings, which was uh, 140 in that range, OK? And nominal voltage was 140, yes. And, and it was for LED strings. It, it comes from, from AEG. Uh, uh, we didn't ask, okay, we assumed that it was something that they needed due to a, a previous design in, in the mechanical part and in the, uh, and the uh, let's say, mechanical part of, of, of the lamp or the combination, the way they have to, to uh, place standard strings. I don't know why, okay, but it, it was uh, something that comes from the company. Uh, we didn't decide to, to split the, the LEDs in, in four strings. It's just something that uh, the company said it was mandatory. And later in the second project uh, for the asymmetrical half reach, they asked us to develop actually two asymmetrical half reach, one for four strings in, in parallel, and the other one for the same amount of, of power, that is the same amount of LEDs, but connected in a way in which you have more strings in parallel, but, but with a lower number of LEDs in each string. But once again, it's something that comes from another department in, in the company, I guess, and we didn't, we didn't ask. We weren't allowed to, to change that also. So. OK. Well, Manu, thank you very much for your nice uh, presentation for us. And uh, I hope that everyone uh, can, can participate in, in in this Friday, we have the, the presentation from Professor Diego Lamar that uh, he will talk yes, about his polite communication uh, circuits that they, they are developing in the University of Oviedo. So thank you very much, uh, Manu. Thank you, Marco, for inviting me.
Então, obrigado, pessoal, pela participação de todos. E sexta-feira temos, então, mais um webinar uh, sobre uh, comunicação por luz visível. Obrigado e um bom dia a todos.